All right, guys, Murph's here. And today, we're gonna talk about this. A Plainfield Machining Company M1 carbine. Now, in order to talk about this rifle, as usual, we are gonna talk about a little bit of history. However, I'm gonna heavily gloss over the pre and during World War II history of this carbine because this is not a World War II carbine. This is a post-war commercial variant. So. I still have to go through a lot of the war history to get to this, but I would like to spend more time on Plainfield than on any of the World War II produced carbines. So, let's get started. The M1 carbine was introduced in the military service in 1942. And the original purpose for this carbine was for it to be a weapon for second line troops, not front line guys, second line troops, or any personnel who are already carrying heavy things like radios or bazookas. So that way they would have something more powerful than a 45, be that in the form of a 1911 or a Thompson, but something much lighter than an M1 Garand. This, and thus, this rifle came along. Now, Eventually, before the war was over, a lot more of these M1 carbines started making it into frontline use. First off, paratroopers became very big fans of the folding stock variant, the M1A1 of this carbine. And a lot of troops in general, as they came across them, discovered that they were much lighter than their military arms. And it was pretty enticing to carry something half the weight over hill and dale during combat and stuff like that, especially if you're already fighting in pretty close proximity to your opponent, the 30 carbine has a lot of advantages over the M1 Garand. Now, keep in mind that this rifle was came out just in time for World War II. And there's a couple of interesting things when you run across the production of this rifle. So originally it was developed by Winchester However, they found out very quickly once the war started and America's involvement in World War II that they could not keep up with their contract that they already had for the production of M1 Garands as well as the demands for the M1 carbine. Before the war was over, we built six million of these. One company could not possibly have kept up with the hundreds of thousands of M1s they were contracted to build as well as the M1 carbine. So, they wound up subcontracting the production to nine other companies. That is why there's a couple of things we really have to take into regard with M1 carbines in general. There are a ton of World War II M1 carbines out on the market, and they demand a premium in general. You're talking about in excess of $800. However, there's a reason that there are people who specialize in the collection of military arms, and that is because there's a ton of information out there to make sure that your M1 carbine is period correct especially once you start to bring in the Plainsfield, Universal, Ivor Johnson, all the other M1 carbines that were produced post-war out on the market. You've really got to know what it is that you're getting into, especially when you consider that during World War II, those nine other companies still had production issues because a lot of them were fairly small companies to begin with and not arms manufacturers by trade. Places like Rockola and Inland, which were... I mean, Rockola was a jukebox manufacturer and Inland was a division of GM, were not arms manufacturers. So it was quite often an issue for, let's say, Rockola built a whole bunch of receivers and stuff like that, but they don't have enough barrels. Well, how are they going to be able to get barrels to be able to finish the production of the rifles and actually meet their quotas? Well, what if we get a hold of Saginaw? They say they have an excess number of barrels. We grab a bunch of Saginaw barrels and we'll attach them to our receivers and everything's good to go. There was actually a committee that was put together from these companies so that as guys ran out of parts, they could communicate with each other and get those parts moved around. That is why there are entire books dedicated to collecting M1 carbines. There are people out there who are actual experts on M1 carbines and many other World War II and prior firearms because there are so many individual things that you have to know about them. Serial number production and all that will tell you what parts are supposed to be on this rifle to begin with for it to be period correct. And there are a bunch of videos if you don't want to read books on it in order to get this information, but it is very important for you to get this information so that you make sure someone's not pulling a fast one on you. That they're not either A, jacking up the price on a carbine that's actually not worth that much, or B, 
trying to pass off a falsified M1 carbine as a World War II carbine and gouging you for money. Like I said before, World War II M1 carbines would be in excess of $800. Plainfield carbines are closer to like $400. So that's a pretty substantial price difference. And I don't want to see you guys losing money when you could be spending that, that $800 on a nice AR or any other number of things that you actually need. So, these carbines did keep finding their way out on the front line. I think that's where I left off before I went on my little tangent. So, by 1944, the Army decided to go ahead and modify a couple of things about the carbine to make it better for frontline use. And we will talk about those and the different features that you'll see across M1 carbine production because the great thing about plain field rifles is that they are a very good kaleidoscope of those differences. Now, War ends in 1945. Springfield Army at that time had already started gearing up with tools and machining to be able to refurbish all these rifles, which they refurbished the post-war guns. They refurbished after Korea when these rifles were used yet again. But then in the 1960s, the United States Army more or less retired the M1 carbine in favor of the M14, along with the M1 Garand. So what they started to do was either A, sell off or enter these rifles into the Lend-Lease programs with our allies so that we could supply people with enough arms to be able to resist communism. Or B, they cut the receivers on the guns and sold the guns and the excess parts that they had in storage on the commercial market. And that is where Plainfield comes in. Now, before Plainfield, there was another gentleman in New Jersey just a couple miles away from the Plainfield Machining Company who was producing post-war M1 carbines out of leftover parts. However, he got himself into a spot of legal trouble and really not going to spend too much time on him except to say that he wound up selling his entire stockpile of post-war parts to Plainfield Machining Company. Now, Plainfield Machining Company of New Jersey decided to go ahead and start producing these rifles. And actually, my favorite thing about Plainfield was that they were a very forward-thinking company. They were really trying to expand beyond just some people who were tinkering around and reassembling M1 carbines. They, they, they wanted to go places, and I really appreciate their, their attempts to go above where they were. Now, when they first started production on the M1 carbines, which was in 1962, they were having trouble meeting demand, so they wound up having to go through a bunch of other dealers and wholesalers and stuff like that in order to keep people at bay. Now, there was an attempt by a fellow named Melvin Johnson, who is famous for inventing the M1941 Johnson rifle, who developed a 5.7 millimeter cartridge specifically for the M1 carbine, actually by necking down the 30 carbine cartridge in order to be able to chamber it in this rifle. And he was talking with Plainfield about having that be something in their catalog. However, Plainfield kept blowing them off, saying something about foreign military contracts and stuff like that. And a lot of people would say that very facetiously, kind of like in air quotes, whenever they talk about Plainfield's foreign military contracts, though these guys were trying to build them up as something that they weren't. However, based on photographic evidence, we have seen those weapons in foreign places. Uh, their paratrooper model, which was a telescoping wire-stocked M1 carbine setup, has been spotted in the hands of South Vietnamese troops. Uh, Plainfield carbines have been seen in the hands of Mexican authorities, and then also when a lot of those carbines that we sent out on the Lend-Lease program have come back, a couple of places had Plainfield M1 carbines intermixed with standard World War II M1 carbines. Specifically, El Salvador and Greece seem to have picked up some Plainfield carbines somewhere along the way. So, these guys actually weren't joking about foreign military contracts. They were actually supplying arms overseas, which I find to be very interesting. I did not know that until I started doing research for this particular video. Now, that was not the only thing that Plainfield did. They also developed a pistol variant with a cut down barrel and stock that never really went anywhere. And then ultimately, the thing that was their undoing was they got into the submachine gun business and attempted to develop a 9mm or 380 caliber submachine gun with a helical magazine. And unfortunately, they ran into so many issues and dumped so much cash into it that by 1975, they were unable to maintain financial capability and were bought out by Ivor Johnson. Very unfortunate. So, 
Now that we've gone over the history, let's talk about this rifle and identify a lot of these features that this rifle shows, where they came from, what you could expect to find on other M1 carbines, so that whenever you go to a gun shop or a gun show and you're appraising an M1 carbine, you kind of know what to look for to get an inkling of whether or not everything's actually matching up properly. My advice, so let's go ahead and get this out of the way. My advice is to never impulse buy an M1 carbine. Not unless you can identify everything about it from memory. If you cannot, go ahead and get as much information off of it as you can, which I'm hoping that this video helps you at least pick out the things that you need to pay attention to or to ask the questions about. Go back, research it, figure out what it is that you wanna pay for it, and then come back. I would never impulse buy any M1 carbine. This M1 carbine was someone's impulse buy before I got a hold of it because they thought by either the seller telling them it was or just their assumption it was a World War II M1 carbine and it's most definitely not. All right, so we have an 18 inch barrel and of course 30 carbine chambered M1 carbine. We have the standard Let's see if I can get a good angle on this. We have the standard front sight that has been used on US military arms since the M1917 Enfield with our central post and protective ears. Coming back to here, we have the Type 3 barrel band which has an incorporated bayonet lug. This did not come out until post 1944. This is part of the upgrades that were put forth because guys were using this on the front line. So they decided that these guys needed to be able to play bayonets should they have to get in close quarters combat with the Germans. This is not the rifle that I would choose to play bayonets with. I'm, I'm at a major reach disadvantage, especially if I'm fighting in the Philippines. You can also see that this is where our sling attaches at. We also have a post-1944 sling, which you can tell by the metal attachments here. Coming back to our handguard, we have the wooden handguard, though many of these post-war rifles were built with a ventilated steel handguard. I prefer the wood. This is also a post-1944, which you can tell by the four rivets in the handguard. Something to keep in mind about these barrel bands while you're shooting is that you want to keep them extremely tight because if you don't, they will walk off and then your handguard will pop off and you look kind of silly. Now, let's talk about our stock. We have an excellent stock here, though it has a ton of post-44 production aspects of it. Now, first off, you see here we have what is referred to as a pot belly stock, which is a little bit more robust design to where your hand goes. This is a post-44 feature. You, we have what is referred to as a low wood stock. So originally, on the pre-1944 models, we had wood that extended up and covered more of this operating rod that you can see right here. And I thought that was a really great idea because that would keep a lot of mud and sand out of the actions. However, it was found that that section was so thin that it would crack quite frequently, which would cause the entire stock to crack, and then you had to put new stock on it. So I guess it was decided that it was a lot easier to clean mud, dirt, and sand out of the action than it was to have to go through and replace stocks. So this is the low wood as opposed to the high wood uh, post-1944 stock. Now then, coming back to our other end of our sling, which attaches to the oiler. Now, this really is the standard production stock. There was another stock which had an I-shaped cutout for the oiler, which was originally designed for a completely different cleaning kit that never got adopted. So actually, if you have an I-cut stock on an M1 carbine, you've got a fairly, fairly rare stock because they didn't actually make very many of them. Now this stock does have cross cannons on it, however it does not have an acceptance stamp. So I figure it's one of two options, either A, this was produced and, and stamped and all that, however it never actually entered service and then got sold off as surplus, so that's why it never actually got an acceptance stamp, or B, somebody was attempting to pass this off as a World War II M1 carbine and slapped a cross cannon stamp on it. Either is possible. Now, let's get back up here to the receiver. So, as we can see here, 
we have plain field stamped over the chamber. That is only done on post-war produced rifles, commercial produced rifles. The actual manufacturer should be stamped back here. And we'll talk more about that once we get back there. But that's one way that you can tell that this is definitely not a World War II carbine. In addition to that, on the left side of the receiver, Plainfield stamped their serial numbers. Serial numbers on World War II M1 carbines belong back here. So there's two indicators right off the bat that we do not have a World War II carbine. Now, these receivers produced by Plainfield are cast receivers. And there's probably a couple people who are wrinkling their nose right now. I would like to point out that not every cast receiver is produced by Century Arms. So there are good casting companies out there. And the first two that come to mind right now are the Ruger Mini 14 and the Springfield M1A, which are both cast receivers. So the cast receiver can be done right. The cast receiver should not be automatically rejected by the casual observer. It is something that requires somebody to maybe pay a little bit more attention to what it is that they're buying. Now, we do have a bolt locking device right here located next to the charging handle and it locks into this little ovular recess right there. When it comes to bolt hold open, the only magazine that causes bolt hold open is the 30 round magazine. Now, our bolt itself, this one in particular is the flat top bolt, which I'm very confused by because everything else on this gun is post-1944, yet the flat top bolt is pre-44. They went to the round bolt in the post-1944 M1 carbine, and they did it for, I've heard two reasons now. One was easier manufacturing, which kind of makes sense to me. And the other reason was because the flat top bolt would crack. I don't know how true that is, but every plain field carbine I've seen has a flat top bolt. So my assumption is that the United States Army just had an absolute ton of those in storage when they offloaded everything that they had for surplus. That's the assumption that I'm working with. The other side of it is somebody once again attempted to change this over into a World War II replica but they didn't do the best job overall. Now the rear sight here is also post 44. The original rear sight was a two aperture L shaped version, which was set up for 100 and 300 yards, non adjustable. This on the other hand is adjustable ramp for distance from like, <laughs> like one yard out to 300 and is adjustable for windage. This is an extremely nice sight, and once again indicates that somebody was like, hmm, maybe we should give these guys what they need for actual combat type application if this is gonna wind up on the front lines. Now, when this sight was installed, this will generally obscure the actual manufacturer. You're gonna have to get in here with like a flashlight and a magnifying glass in order to be able to get even an inkling of who the manufacturer was. But take that time if someone's claiming this is a World War II carbine so that you can go over this and make sure everything's how it's supposed to be. The manufacturer and the serial number are going to be major helps in making sure everything else about this is what it's supposed to be. Now let's go ahead and come down here. We have our push button magazine release and a swivel lever safety. Now the original setup was a cross bolt safety and the push button mag release. But that was found to be very difficult for soldiers because guys would either intend to hit their cross bolt safety and accidentally drop their magazine, or they would mean to drop their magazine and accidentally hit their cross bolt safety. Either is an unacceptable outcome. So they switched it over to this lever type setup post 1944. Now our trigger is extremely heavy. Um, eight pounds, eight to 10 pounds is generally what these are considered to come in at. This is not a marksman's rifle. It is very much so a short range PDW type setup. Now you'll see back here, I have a dual magazine pouch, which I've switched over to being on the right side of the gun because I'm left-handed and it really messes with my cheek to stock weld. Inside I have a 15 and 10 round magazine. 
you can get 30 round magazines and I believe five rounders for this gun. And on the back here, we have a metal butt plate. All right, so there's our features. How does it shoot? All right, guys, so in general, M1 carbines were not built with accuracy in mind. So if you have a four MOA M1 carbine, you have a good M1 carbine. That is, that is exceeding expectation in that case. The vast majority of World War II M1 carbines have been found to be doing worse than four MOA. However, the plain fields have been renowned as fantastic shooters. Overall, I've been pretty happy with how this plain field shoots. Now, I have had a couple of mechanical issues with the gun. And a lot of it came from the gas system. Now, a couple of years ago, I took this out to the range and I was shooting it. And the next thing I knew, it was operating like a bolt action. I had to charge the system after every shot. So I took it home, took it apart, cleaned it. And when I put it back together, I found I had spare parts. That's, that's normally an issue. So I took it all apart again and I looked at an exploded view of all the parts and I found that the retaining ring for the short gas piston had fallen out, allowing the gas piston to fall out as well. So that's problematic. I put everything back together appropriately this time, and then I had a, a thought occur to myself that perhaps I'd messed up somewhere. So I took it all back apart and I pulled that retaining ring out and found that I could not free the gas piston. So I played with that for quite a while, trying a couple of different methods that I read about on the internet involving compressed air to try to get that thing to come loose, and came to the realization that I had two options. I could either A, take it to the range, load around in it, and take the risk of it exploding in order to unstick that gas piston, or I could just take it to a gunsmith, which was probably the better idea because the retaining ring had already fallen out, which could mean that that port had actually cracked, allowing gas to seep past it and unscrew itself. So I took it to a gunsmith, everything got worked out. They replaced the parts that needed to be replaced and now it runs pretty good. Now, in general, M1 carbines are not built for reliability. And a lot of that has to come to the magazine. The magazines are very cheap, they are very flimsy and they are most definitely one-time use throwaway. However, of course, none of us have the money to keep running out and buying M1 carbine magazines, so we reuse them. And that is why we have issues. I've actually heard quite a few reports from troops during the war who indicated that like every month they would cycle through, get rid of all their old M1 carbine magazines, draw new M1 carbine magazines and load them up. So they're, they're definitely considered a disposable item. Now, with that being the case, what do I use this for? Well, Honestly, it's become just a plinking gun. I have thrown this across the back seat as a truck gun before. However, based on its current setup, I would not do that anymore because I have a lot of guns that are purpose built for fighting and this is not one. I could see this as a home defense gun in the same way that I use my shotguns in home defense, which just controlling an access point of some sort. With current ammunition, you can get hollow points, soft points, and ballistic tips, so you can definitely find defensive rounds for this carbine instead of just using full metal jackets. 
I have considered using this for hunting. However, the hunting that I've done in the state that I live in now, the last couple of shots I took were between two and 250. And I would not, I am not convinced that this cartridge can produce a ethical kill on a deer sized target between two and 250 at all. Uh, completely fine with taking this against a person out to 300, but even then I'm not really expecting a whole lot to come from stretching that cartridge that far. I would prefer to use this in 100 and under in the vast majority of situations, including hunting. I could see this as a loner rifle, if like the end of the world or you know some crazy stuff goes down and somebody needs a gun, I could see loaning this to them. I think they would find it very easy to use. It's light recoiling, handy rifle at five pounds. This thing is extremely easy to maneuver and being as short as it is, it's extremely easy to work with. What do I suggest you use it for though? Well, guys, a lot of the same stuff that I just said applies. If you're doing a lot of stock type hunting or you live in heavy brush or hunt in heavy brush, this is a great option as long as you're keeping the shots below 100 yards. Um, if you were looking to use this for a fighting rifle, I would consider this a second line gun unless you decided to get an Ultimac replacement handguard which is railed. That way you could, you could put lights, optics, all that kind of stuff on it. Once you have optic light sling, you've got a functioning fighting rifle at that point, so I can't really argue with you on that. Now, if you live in a restrictive gun state and this happens to be legal for use, then you've really lucked out. This, if this is legal for use, but an, M, an AR-15 is not, then you've got a fantastic option right here. In the 60s and 70s, this was America's AR-15. This was the right arm of the civilian side of the American shooter. So you would not be unarmed with this gun. It, it is actually a pretty good performing overall option, and I, I really think it would serve you well in that capacity. The biggest issue is going to be ammo cost, because 5.56 and 7.62x39, those, plat, those platforms have cheaper ammunition than the M1 carbine does, which runs about the same price that cheap 357 mag, Magnum does. So, something to keep in mind there. Now, overall, guys, I think that pretty much captures my thoughts with this particular carbine. So I hope you found this uh, informative and I definitely hope that you got enough information from me to point out things that you wanna be able to identify about a carbine. Now, there are a lot of people who put out some really great videos on the M1 carbines and what to look for and track down all the pieces and parts and all that kind of stuff. Uh, Ian from Forgotten Weapons has several really good M1 carbine videos and I highly suggest that you check them out. Also, Mishiko has quite a few M1 Carbine Collector's videos. So if you're looking for more information on how to best identify what it is that you're looking at or what it is that you already own, they're definitely the ones to go to. So have a good day.